Hey, this is Jerry, the Wi-Fi guy. In this video, we're going to learn how to speak fluent Wi-Fi. Now, if you're an American traveling in a country like France, Spain, or Italy, it's still possible to enjoy your trip, even if you don't know the language or the customs, because most people in Europe speak English as their second language. Even so, it'll make your trip more gratifying if you take a little time to learn a few phrases in the language, some customs, and some of the items on the menu. In the same way, knowing a few things about the jargon of home networking and wireless routers can make your journey to having a home network you can take pride in more enjoyable and help you make less expensive mistakes. This is the video complement to Chapter 2 of my ebook, The Home IT Handbook, which you can download for free at wifiguy.net, the site that helps you go from computer novice to home IT pro. In this short, simple video, we're going to cover some of the main topics and the most important features of wireless networking to help you make better decisions when buying wireless gear for your home network. In 2018, the Association of Wireless Networking Whizbangs, or IEEE, decided to make the leap from the alphabet soup of wireless protocols to an easier to remember system of numbers. So now 802.11G is known as Wi-Fi 3, 802.11N is Wi-Fi 4, AC is Wi-Fi 5, and AX is Wi-Fi 6. Yes, there was actually a Wi-Fi 1 and a Wi-Fi 2, but their speeds were so slow and the range was so horrible, it's barely worth mentioning them anymore. Wireless G, or Wi-Fi 3, was just good enough for people to take notice of Wi-Fi, but not good enough to meet the demand once wireless networking became more popular and they started creating more wireless devices. When looking at this chart, it's easy to think that Wi-Fi 6 is actually three times faster than Wi-Fi 5. But actually, a single stream of Wi-Fi 6 is actually only about 40% faster than Wi-Fi 5. So how did we get to this? Okay, well, for example, back in the days of Wi-Fi 3, you were only looking at a single stream. As time went on, they started adding bands and streams to Wi-Fi routers to the point where these numbers got almost ridiculous. So how do we end up with all these crazy letters and numbers? In order to understand that, you need to understand something you probably haven't heard a lot about, which is spatial streams. A spatial stream is simply a connection that sends and receives data to your wireless router and any wireless device. So as an example, Wi-Fi 3, back in the day of wireless G, had only one spatial stream to share with all its devices. Wi-Fi 4 entered the picture with as much as three spatial streams. Wi-Fi 5 or AC could support as many as four spatial streams. These days we have wireless AX or wireless 6 and it can support as many as eight streams and if the wireless router is configured with three bands, you're looking at a potential 12 streams. So back in the day of wireless G or Wi-Fi 3, things were pretty bleak. You had a router with a single antenna and a single stream. And it would make a connection with the Wi-Fi device and it was all good because back then, there weren't that many Wi-Fi devices. So you had a single stream going to a single wireless device. And then if you bought another Wi-Fi device, you'd have a single stream going to two wireless devices. And that usually worked okay. But the problem is that single stream is now being split up between two wireless devices. And as Wi-Fi became more and more popular, people would add devices and the signal strength and the speed would get worse and worse. In addition to that problem, Wi-Fi 3 didn't do a very good job of making its way around obstacles either. So despite all these difficulties, people had had their taste of Wi-Fi and they wanted more. 
This forced manufacturers to come up with their own proprietary ways of speeding things up and beating out the competition. So that's when you started hearing things like Super G and G+. Unfortunately, most of these were proprietary and only worked if you bought devices from the same manufacturer as the router. So along came 802.11n or Wi-Fi 4. Wi-Fi 4 brought with it a number of advances. One of them was dual bands. By adding a second band, users had the choice between two different frequency bands. The 2.4 GHz frequency band is slower than the 5 GHz band, but it has more range and can travel through walls better. The 5 GHz band is faster, but doesn't have the same range as 2.4. The thing about this was these two bands could be used simultaneously in the same space without interfering with each other. This prevented wireless devices from being slowed down by other wireless devices on your own home network. Unlike Wi-Fi 3, which had only one stream, Wi-Fi 4 had three streams, and each stream was capable of 150 megabits per second, as opposed to Wireless G, which was only capable of 54. By adding these streams and bands up, manufacturers could give the impression they were selling you some crazy super fast wireless router. So for example, you would have three streams on one band and three streams on the other band for a total of six streams, which could come out to as much as 900 megabits per second. And that's what they would put on the box. Unfortunately, most devices can only pick up one or two spatial streams, but that didn't prevent manufacturers from using this as a marketing gimmick. On this particular router, we have two streams on the 2.4 gigahertz band. 150 times 2 equals 300. And then you put three streams on the 5 gigahertz band. 3 times 150 is 450. They would add all these together and call it a 750 megabits per second wireless router. Well, you know, that sounds good, but it really only serves the purpose of comparing it to other wireless routers. You're really not going to get 700 megabits per second on any device because most devices only can support one or two spatial streams at a time. So even though your router says it's a 750 megabits per second router, you're actually only going to get about 150 to 300 megabits per second on a wireless end device. The point still remains, Wi-Fi 4 is still a huge improvement over Wi-Fi 3. All these innovations kept people happy for a few years, but as usual, people can't get enough of a good thing. And soon people were confronted by the limitations of Wi-Fi 4, and Wi-Fi 5 was born. Wi-Fi 5 is when things started getting crazy, mostly due to the enormous amount of bandwidth required by online gaming. Somehow, winning online games became synonymous with having the biggest, baddest wireless router with the most antennas and the most bandwidth. This brought about the phenomenon known as gaming routers. Some gaming routers actually have useful features for gamers, such as Duma OS, that actually enhance the gamer's performance and experience, but at a cost. For everyday users, wireless AC or Wi-Fi 5 still had many advantages. For one thing, it's three times as fast as Wi-Fi 4, and the newer Wave 2 devices introduced a new form of MIMO called MUMIMO or MU-MIMO, which I'll explain in a minute. One of the limitations of Wi-Fi 5 was it only worked on the 5 GHz band. So what you would get is you would get a dual band wireless router and you could run Wi-Fi 5 on one band and Wi-Fi 4 on the other. So a typical dual band wireless router you'd find on the market would have 5 gigahertz on one band and 2.4 gigahertz on the other. They would have three spatial streams of Wi-Fi 5 on the 5 gigahertz band, which comes out to 1300. Then they put three spatial streams of Wi-Fi 4 on the 2.4 gigahertz bands, which equals 450 megabits per second. So they would add those two together, 
and say this is a 1750 megabits per second router. Now, you and I both know that that's BS, but for comparison purposes, it's still accurate. Another thing that some people miss is in order to get these AC speeds, you need to have an AC device. So in order to get the most benefit from this Wi-Fi 5 router, you want to get a Wi-Fi 5 adapter for a laptop or a device that supports Wi-Fi 5. In addition, if you want to connect to more than one spatial stream at a time, that device also has to support MIMO or MU MIMO, which we'll get into in a minute. So on this wireless router, if you have a device that's connected to the 5 gigahertz band with only one spatial stream, you're going to get a maximum of 433 megabits per second. Actually, after you subtract 30% for overhead and other types of interference, not to mention distance, that number is going to be a lot less. With Wi-Fi 6, the trend continues. The Wi-Fi 6 signal is actually only about 40% faster than Wi-Fi 5, but with the ability to support as many as 8 spatial streams and increasing the channel width, you get another exponential jump in performance. I go into details about channels in the ebook. Keep in mind that in order to realize the advantages of Wi-Fi 6, you want to have a Wi-Fi 6 device or get an adapter for your device that supports Wi-Fi 6. I personally would wait until Wi-Fi 6 devices become the norm before going out and buying a Wi-Fi 6 router. But that's just me. I've never been one to rush out and spend all my hard-earned money on the latest and greatest when I know if I'm just a little patient, prices will eventually come down as the technology continues to move forward. I don't want to be the guy standing there scratching my head going, man, I just paid twice that for the same thing a year ago. Then again, I have been fortunate enough to have the latest and greatest technology, and I know how exciting it can be. As an American traveling in Europe, it doesn't hurt to know some of the phrases in the local language and the customs of the country you're visiting. It's also helpful to know something about the food and what's in some of the dishes on the menu without having to ask the waiter to explain it all to you. When shopping for a wireless router, you're liable to come across all kinds of words and acronyms that make little sense to you without doing a little research first. In this section, we're going to cover some of the most important features you'll find on wireless routers that directly impact the performance of your network and the price you pay at checkout. The first of these features is MIMO or MIMO which stands for Multiple Input, Multiple Output. Now earlier, we discussed the bleak existence of Wireless 3 or Wireless G, where you had a single stream spread out amongst multiple devices. Now in this case, each one of these four devices is actually only getting 25% or a quarter of the available bandwidth on this wireless router. And that is not good. In the case of Wi-Fi 4, which supported MIMO, each device was able to get its own dedicated connection to the wireless router. This happened really fast, which made it seem to the devices that they each had their own dedicated wireless router. Even so, as you added more devices, there was an eventual slowdown because even though each device is getting its own 100% connection, it had to wait in turn with the other wireless devices. So along came MU MIMO or MIMO to the rescue with Wi-Fi 5. Now it didn't happen immediately. It didn't really hit the streets until wave 2 of Wi-Fi 5 came out. So just because you have a Wi-Fi 5 device, it doesn't mean it supports MU MIMO. You need to look at that device's documentation to make sure it does. So what MU MIMO is, is it's simply MIMO or MIMO for multiple users. This means instead of each device having to wait its turn for that one single stream of Wi-Fi goodness, everybody got it at once. Of course, this does have its limitations depending on how many streams you have and what your device supports. Even so, this is a quantum leap from where we were with Wi-Fi 3. 
MU MIMO also works very well with something called beamforming. There was such a thing as beamforming with Wi-Fi 4, but because of various limitations, the two struggle to get along very well. Now you'll rarely see one without the other. As you remember, with previous standards, the wireless router signal basically just spewed out in all directions, and if it hit something, fine. If it didn't, whatever. This resulted in a lot of wasted energy trying to establish a signal connection with walls and lampshades. With beamforming, a connection is established and it locks onto the device and concentrates its signal in that device's direction. This results in a much stronger and more stable wireless connection. A good way to think about beamforming is by comparing the intensity of a light bulb with the intensity of the beam from a flashlight. You could probably stare at a light bulb all day and it wouldn't bother you, but you wouldn't want to stand directly into a flashlight beam for too long. That's a good illustration of how much stronger a Wi-Fi signal with beamforming is. Another acronym you're going to see a lot of is QoS. What QoS stands for is quality of service. QoS is a set of rules that guarantees certain types of traffic on your home network have priority over others. For example, if you're watching a movie or playing a video game, you don't want to get hit with a bunch of lag because mom is busy downloading a recipe for blueberry muffins in the kitchen. When you're setting up QoS on your home network, you can specify certain types of traffic, such as video streaming or gaming over file transfers, or you can prioritize certain devices, such as your gaming computer or the TV in the living room over the computer in the guest bedroom. Each wireless router manufacturer has its own implementation of QoS. The interfaces will be different, some of the terminology will be different, but it all boils down to the same thing. You're basically just assigning priorities to different devices or different types of traffic. In this example, we have cars driving down a three-lane highway, and each car is doing something different. This guy is checking out in his email. This guy is on Amazon. This guy is looking up blueberry muffin recipes. And everyone else is on Facebook. A tiny amount of lag or a few milliseconds here and there is not going to ruin anyone's day. But then along comes this guy. He's got more important things to do. He's binge watching Game of Thrones and doesn't want any interruptions from anybody for any reason. If something does happen, he's liable to say something he doesn't want his kids to hear. If he's using adaptive QoS, that means he has manually configured his wireless router to prioritize traffic such as video streaming over other things such as file transfers and web surfing. That being the case, when it comes time for Game of Thrones, the wireless router opens up a new lane just for him. Now, if he's using dynamic QoS, he didn't have to configure anything. He just needed to go into his wireless router and turn it on. And his wireless router will recognize different types of traffic and different types of devices and prioritize everything for him. So once the wireless router sees that he is in an emergency situation compared to all these other forms of traffic, it creates a separate lane just for him. Another feature that's becoming more spread these days is called airtime fairness. What airtime fairness does is it simply keeps the slower devices on your network from taking up so much of everybody else's time. The word airtime and airtime fairness simply means the time it takes for a signal to travel through the air before it reaches its destination. The standard way of dividing things up between devices on a network used to be with packets. So what would happen is a Wi-Fi 4 device would get to deliver 10 packets, then a Wi-Fi 10 device would get to deliver 10 packets, then a Wi-Fi 4 device, and then a Wi-Fi 5 device, etc., etc. So the end result is the Wi-Fi 5 device spends more time waiting for the Wi-Fi 4 device to send its packets than it does sending its own packets. So what they do with airtime fairness is instead of dividing things up by packets, it divides things up 
by time. So the Wi-Fi 4 device will get a certain amount of time, and then the Wi-Fi 5 device will get an equal amount of time, and then the Wi-Fi 4 device, etc., etc. So in this way, the Wi-Fi device, which is probably the more important device, can send out way more data, and it doesn't really slow the Wi-Fi 4 device up that much. The end result is the total efficiency and throughput of the network increases. Another feature you'll see a lot of, and particularly wireless AC devices, is Smart Connect. What Smart Connect does is as simple as it is ingenious. It simply puts your slower devices on the slower bands and your faster devices on the faster bands, which keeps your faster devices from being slowed down by the slower ones. There's really not much configuration involved. You just have to turn it on and it works. So in this example, they take this phone and they move it off of the 5 gigahertz network and they move it over to the 2.4 gigahertz network. They take this PlayStation and move it over from the 2.4 gigahertz network and put it on the 5 gigahertz network. And they take this printer off the 5 gigahertz network and put it on the 2.4. Now everyone is happy and where they belong and no one's getting in anyone else's way. Okay, now Smart Connect is not a perfect solution. In some cases, turning it on can cause other problems. So it's really up to you if you want to use it or not. If you're having problems with Smart Connect not doing everything automatically for you, the simple solution is just to manually connect your devices to the proper network. So that concludes this video. I hope you got something out of it. If you did, please do the thing with the yada yada. In my next video, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of actually setting up, securing, and backing up a wireless router. Using a router which has recently replaced the ASUS as my new favorite wireless router under $100.